Welcome to this week's OK at Work with myself, Sarah Sawyer, and my colleague, Russell Berger, both attorneys at Offit Kerman. And today we are talking about a hot off the presses decision involving the National Labor Relations Board and the National Labor Relations Act and severance agreements. So uh, there's been a new decision that's come down from the board involving the inclusion of non-disparagement and, um, and non-disclosure pieces in them. Sorry, I'm tripping over my language. <laughs> <laughs> no, no worries. Well, I can take you from there, Sarah. Yes. <laughs> I, I think the uh, so so what this decision does is basically um, leverages the National Labor Relations Act, which is a law that uh, while it oftentimes gets utilized in union situations, um, you know, applies to all employees. And what it per prohibits an employer from doing is is engaging in any conduct that would restrict uh, an employee from engaging in what's known as protected concerted activity. Um, and what the board did in this decision is they determined that um, restricting disparaging comments broadly uh, and, and, and having a confidentiality provision in a severance agreement, again, another broad provision, um, re violates Section 7 of the Act, which is what we're talking about here. So it really gets to can, you know, the issue of whether an employer can have a non-disparagement or confidentiality and or confidentiality provision in a severance agreement with an employee. Um, as, a, as an important caveat here, the National Labor Relation Act, um, Relations Act, as it defines employee, um, applies to those that aren't in any kind of supervisory role because uh, the act protects those that would be unionized and not the management team um, or employees at that level. So for employees that are, you know, that we would commonly refer to as employees, they might not be employees under the act. If they're not employees under the act, this doesn't affect them at all, no change. Um, for employees under the act, if you were to give them a severance, you absolutely should revisit the non-disparagement provision and the confidentiality provision in your severance agreement. And um, really, I think it's something you should talk about with counsel because there's different degrees of aggressiveness or conservativeness that you may want to take. Um, but what I will tell you is you absolutely should look at the non-disparagement and the confidentiality. You absolutely, uh, I think, should include carve-out language that uh, specifically says that if you leave these provisions in an agreement, that they're only enforceable up to the extent that they do not violate Section 7 of the Act. Um, and you definitely should have, if you don't have it already, uh, a severability clause in your severance agreement, which basically means that if we're wrong on the law on something, if some part of this is unenforceable, the rest of the agreement can still go on and survive uh, once we void out the unenforceable portion. Yeah, and it's it really is important to take a look at this because most severance agreements that employers use will include one, if not both, of these issues, right? So non-disparagement, very common in almost every severance agreement when employers are saying, hey, I'm going to pay you a bunch of money. I don't want you to go out there interfering with our business by, you know, talking about the company. So definitely something that's really common in there. Same thing with the confidentiality. So definitely good to be proactive here um, and take a look. And, it, and it's interesting because this has been a change that has happened. Um, things have gone back and forth with the NLRB uh, involving these these rulings, and it is a political body that does change with uh, who's in the White House. So, you know, it'll be interesting to see where things go with this in the future. Um, in the past, we've had rulings that were um, different than this, which is why we have been including those types of provisions in agreements in the past. And now, very swiftly, there's a big reversal, a big change in the rules. And so, um, that's that's the the rules of the of the day, and that could change again in the future as well. Yeah, it, it's a lot like, uh, you know, when it starts off swinging, you know, swings a little bit, it swings a little bit, and the more momentum and over time, the swings start getting farther and farther apart. So now you when you know, depending on who's in charge of the White House and who's in charge of the NLRB, you know, the, the rulings seem to be getting more and more extreme, more and more polarized, which is, you know, regardless of which way it comes out, is a challenging thing for employers. Um, because while the NLRB, you know, it's not a place where, you sue, you know, employees will sue employers in the traditional sense to get a monetary recovery. Um, rules are made there and injunctive relief is uh, abound in the NLRB proceedings. So, you know, just being prepared for that and knowing what's coming is, uh, 
um, you know, is a challenge to anticipate at this point, to say the least. Yeah, and always nuanced and nothing's ever straightforward, right? So it's a good to dive into the details here and make sure you're doing it correctly. And, um, you know, just as you mentioned, Russell, just striking the provisions may not be uh, it may not be as easy as that. In most instances, it probably won't be. So I mean, <laughs> that's something you, to consider. you could and you would be uh, you would be within the bounds of the law if you did it. But maybe that's not the best way to go about doing it. And frankly, uh, you know, I'm not sure that uh, employers would want to pay as much in severance if these things were struck altogether. So, you know, it, it, it's, you know, even more nuanced as to whether this ruling actually benefits employees or not. Yeah, good point, Russell. All right, thanks. We'll see you next time. Thanks, Sarah.